I'd like to thank all of you for, for having me here. I feel very welcomed into the, uh, to be a companion on the journey with you. And um, I'd especially like to thank Annika, who said, you've got to meet this guy, Sean, he's a soul brother. And also Ursula, who uh, wrote, wrote to me and said, I think you and Sean have a lot in common. And I'm very grateful for that. So thank you, Ursula. And uh, also thank you for, thank you to Karen Rubin, who helped to arrange this. And of course, Lawrence, who does amazing work keeping this whole thing going. So, uh, and then of course to Sean, without whom we wouldn't be gathering at all. So I hope Sean has a, is having a good vacation and um, I hope I can live up to his expectations. <laughs> so it's kind of ironic, um, my giving a homily because I was an agnostic the first third of my life. Um, my <clears throat> mother believed in uh, nature as God. She didn't believe in a personal God. She said, I, I have to admit though, there is some consciousness in nature. When you look at the trees and the flowers, there is some higher intelligence working here. And my father was a scientist and he also um, said, you have to, except that there's some amazing intelligence, like the liver alone produces, a, has a thousand different functions. And uh, no human could arrange, could develop something as complicated and intricate as that. So there has to be some kind of intelligence behind that. But, um, so I, I could see their point. And I, I also was amazed at nature but I did not accept that there was a personal God. Um, so I, I grew up in sort of a heathen community on the East Coast. There were very powerful, wealthy people all around and they were pursuing material, material things and ego driven goals. And I saw that they weren't happy. Uh, but I didn't see any other source of happiness, really. And I tried, I tried praying, and I didn't really get any answers. I said, if there's a God up there, please let me know, and you could prove your existence by uh, fulfilling this request, you know. And I really, um, I got more results from praying to Santa Claus uh, I would pray to Santa for a certain present and I would get it. And they said, and Santa knows if you've been good or bad. Well, that's kind of my definition of God, or at least when I was five years old. And um, then I was disappointed when I saw that my mother had a bunch of presents stored in the closet just before Christmas. And I got the message that she was Santa. So that was kind of a rude awakening, but I, I still didn't hear from God Almighty, um, where are you? I, I'm looking for a message. So I just went on under the assumption um, that there was sort of an impersonal God. And um, then I started to, well, I'd like to say, I, I met, I've been looking at the origin of the word religion and it seems to come from the, the Latin relegare, which means actually to bind again, like a ligature comes from the same root, you know? So something that holds things together or that binds us. And um, in one sense, religion binds or can bind us to God, but it can also bind us to empty ritual. Uh, it can be a form of mind control, or it can be a form of inspiration. Um, the word ligature, like our tendons in our bodies are ligatures that hold us together. But if they're not functioning right, we get arthritis, and then the ligatures bind us. So the way religion starts out usually is people have some type of experience. There's some individual who 
sees God or experiences God in some way and becomes enlightened. And, uh, and then he attracts, that person attracts followers. Um, I met Ananda May Ma in India, this woman that Yogananda wrote about. So she didn't, you know, it was before the internet. She didn't say, hey, I'm enlightened. Uh, come one and all and be my followers. You know, it just spontaneously happened. And she was the real thing. And I was very blessed to meet her. But there are other beings also. Um, Ramana Maharshi was meditating on a mountain in southern India. <clears throat> People realized he had an expanded consciousness, and then a whole movement grew up around him. And um, usually, as long as the person that became realized was still alive, everything went well. But then after they died, their followers started arguing about what was said and what the real meaning was. And then, you know, then you had different branches of the organization and so on. And then you tend to get into the aspect of religion where it can be binding. Of course, you know, if you think of religion as a box, the box can hold you in, but it can also protect you. And um, so there is definitely a place for religion, but it's nice if the religion helps you to actually have the experience yourself. And as Sean says, we are all priests, you know, we are all God beings, we are God beings in spacesuits, and it's nice if the religion helps you to realize that, unfortunately, some religions want to hold on to people and say, you can't find that out yourself, you can only achieve salvation through the priest or through the ritual. This is not just Catholicism. Um, I went to a Tibetan Buddhist practice and uh, it was chanted in Tibetan. And I said to the people on either side of me, what are we doing? And they said, well, we don't really know, but it must be good for us. And um, so, you know, that was a kind of rude awakening that there's so many people doing empty ritual without understanding what it means. So I started reading the English of the Tibetan ritual and really got quite a lot out of it. And, um, and um, I remember once I, I went to a, a Jewish synagogue uh, because my ancestors are, are Jewish and I thought I should find out what this religion is all about. So someone gave me a ticket, I think it was Yom Kippur, it was one of the high holy days, and I was in Chicago, I was shocked that a ticket cost a hundred dollars, but they had a ticket and they gave it to me, and uh, the rabbi was chanting in Hebrew, and I didn't understand a word of it, and the people around me were talking about their business investments, and where they were going on vacation, and I thought, you know what, I'm out of here. This is really boring. And uh, I got up discreetly to leave and two real big guys came up and grabbed me and they said, you can't leave. And I went, whoa, this is heavy duty, you know? So I was forced to sit there for, I don't know, one and a half to two hours listening to this Hebrew being chanted. And then, you know, when they came by with the scrolls, everybody would want to touch the scrolls. Then they go back to talking about their vacations and stuff. So to me, this was an example of the binding aspect of religion. It did hold the community together. It gave people a sort of common, common bond, but it didn't seem to give people the tools to experience God themselves, you know? So I sort of really, at a certain age in my 20s, well, I'd sort of given up on a personal God. And, you know, I, but I, I found, I moved to New York City and um, someone suggested that I try Hatha Yoga just for my health, you know, not to any kind of spiritual reason, but just as a good form of exercise. <clears throat> and um, right at the very first 
uh, session in the beginning, I started to feel energy going through my body. And I went, wow, there is really something beyond the material plane. You know, there's more than just flesh and blood and neurons and things like that. There is really a higher, higher force that's going through my body. And uh, so I left the yoga class when it was over and went to a metaphysical bookstore. And I said, I want the best book you have on yoga. And they gave me uh, the biography of Ramakrishna, this Indian saint who was called the God man. And um, so that really launched me on the mystical path to, to really try to find God within myself, you know, to have some kind of enlightenment experience. But I didn't get very far with it. I, I kept doing the Hatha Yoga. And I had some interesting experiences, but I could not say I really experienced what Ramakrishna did. And then one day, uh, a friend in the country had a farm and he invited me up for the weekend. And I was very glad to get out of the city. And out of gratitude to him, I said, can I do some work on the farm? I'm sure you have lots of work that could be done. And he said, well, there's some, there's some ponies in the barn and they've been in there all winter and the manure is piling up. I'd be very grateful if you take a pitchfork out and shovel out the barn. So I went out there with the pitchfork and um, he opened the, uh, <clears throat> the window in the door. It was a double door and you could open the top part. So there was just a pile of manure in there. I mean, it was going to take days to get rid of it all. So I started shoveling and something happened. I don't know, maybe about an hour into it. I was just doing this routine work, not thinking about anything. Suddenly I disappeared, like Peter disappeared. And I was pure light. Um, and it was absolute, there was absolute light and bliss and the sound of Om. Now it wasn't the kind of Om you can chant. It was more like the Indian musical instrument, the tambura, it's kind of a drone. And when we chant Om, that's just a sort of a reminder of it. Nothing can do justice to that beautiful sound. It's the sound of pure consciousness that permeates it permeates reality, actually. And I don't know how long I was in that state. That's what they call um, uh, a form of samadhi or satchitaranda. That's consciousness, existence, and bliss. And it was amazing. Without doing any special mantra or practice, I, I was just given this experience. And then I knew that there was light at the end of the tunnel. There was some type of God experience that you could have. And uh, so that, that gave me an incentive. And um, then at some point, I don't remember exactly when it was, I, uh, I had a memory of before I was born. And Sean talks about this type of experience where he says we're gods in spacesuits, something to that effect, I believe. And um, in this experience, it was prior to my birth in a physical body, I was a soul up above the earth. And I, I, I don't remember all of you, but um, there were many, many beings up there. And uh, we were all in communication telepathically. And there was no need, no wants, needs, no suffering. We were basically uh, God beings, uh, God conscious and aware of each other. And there was just tremendous love and beauty. It's kind of like a cosmic Zoom session where if you wanted to, you know, like pin someone, you just think, uh, oh, Stefan, I'd like to talk with you, and boom, you'd be there, you know? So it was really beautiful. You could contact anyone you wanted, and there was just this sharing, just like we're sharing now, just love and light and realizations and stuff. And then 
one day these two beings appeared to me and I realized now one of them was Jesus was wearing a, a white robe and there was another being next to him who I didn't know at the time, but that turned out to be this being known as Saint Germain. And they said, it's time to go back down. And I said, to earth, you gotta be kidding. I'm not going back down there. And they said, you agreed. And I said, I don't remember any agreement, you know, and I was gonna say, show me where I signed, you know, but they started pushing me. They each one put a hand on my shoulder and started pushing me toward the earth. And they said, forget who you are. And I said, I'm not going to forget. And they said, yes, because I knew that I was a God being at that point. I mean, I don't know that I used that term, but I said, I liked where I was and I liked my state of mind. And I said, I'm not going to forget. And they said, yes, you are. And the closer I came to earth, I felt my consciousness going away. And the next thing I experienced was I was this, um, you know, 10 pound baby in a crib, wet and cold and hungry and crying and um, not knowing who I was at all. And um, I, I just knew I didn't want to be there. <laughs> And um, at some point, I don't know, it might have been after a couple of months, I was aware every now and then somebody would come in and hand me a bottle. In those days, they had glass bottles with a uh, latex nipple that was not very satisfying. And someone would hand me that and at least the hunger would go away. And one day I thought, I want to see who this is who brings me the bottle. And I sort of raised my head a bit and I saw my mother and I went, oh no, not her again, because I could still, I could see people's karma. And I saw that we had a karmic connection, went back over many lifetimes and there had been a lot of suffering uh, between us, you know. And uh, I felt I was completely at her mercy, but I, I heard the words, don't worry, she won't hurt you in this lifetime because as your mother, she's bound to love you. And so, but as I got older, I could still see, when I met someone, I would still see like car their karma or past lifetimes. And uh, I discovered that if I talked about that, people didn't like it. And uh, it just got me in trouble. So I sort of asked to forget that not be able to do those things. And then I just found myself a regular guy, you know, trying to be one of the guys, you know, and, um, you know, play soccer and stuff like that, you know. And um, anyway, at some point, I, I had the desire to, uh, well, I have to say, I, in high school, it seemed like most of my friends were Presbyterians, um, especially there were a few girls I liked and they were Presbyterians. So I joined the Presbyterian youth group. And then the, the priest or the, 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 the minister put pressure on my mother to join the church because I guess they wanted her to contribute financially. And so you have to join the, the church, you know. And um, I remember the minister said, don't worry, we're just going to do this little ritual before the church service uh, in the sacristy where they had a baptismal font. And don't worry, it's just a piece of cake. All you have to say is, I believe. But he didn't tell me what I was going to have to swear to. So we got in there and he read the Apostles' Creed, where I believe in God the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and uh, God created, you know, God's only son is Jesus. And I thought, how does God the Father create a, create a child without a mother, you know? And uh, I thought that was kind of a little bit of trickery there. They were leaving something out of that, you know? And then, you know, then, of course, 
Jesus, in the end, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father for all eternity. And I thought that must be awfully boring. I mean, eternity is a long time. And um, to have to just sit there, I mean, no video games. They didn't have video games there, but, you know, no soccer or anything. And, um, and then he's going to come back and judge the, the guilty and the dead. And I thought, the dead are already dead. Can't you leave them alone? You know, it's like, what's this judgment thing, you know? So I wasn't too excited about being a, a Presbyterian. And, um, but it was this desire as I started, as I, as I, my life unfolded and I started studying the, um, the yogic path that I got the pull to go to India. And um, that's where I started to really meet uh, what we called realized beings. And um, the amazing thing is I, I met people in India who lived on the street and they were happy. You know, I'd walk around New York City or in the suburbs where I lived and people seem miserable or alcoholic or whatever. And I got to India, there was a guy selling peanuts there who seemed really happy or the rickshaw, the guy that took me in the rickshaw was smiling and joking and talking about God. And, you know, he just was praying throughout the day and singing beautiful songs to different gods. And I thought, this is, these people have something. I want to find out what that is. And um, I met some amazing beings that could work amazing miracles, uh, but they didn't seem to teach me anything. After being in India for a month and eating the Indian food, which was very spicy and cooked to death, I. I started craving, um, well, I used to have a farm in upstate New York, and I, I loved to have spinach steam very lightly with butter on it, and then I'd make some toasted chapatis. And I started craving a meal like that. Well, one day I was wandering around in the Himalayas uh, north, along the shores of the Ganges, and uh, I came to the town of Rishikesh, and um, um, I was sitting in the main square there and two, two young German kids came up to me and they said, our guru sent us to get you. He told us you would be here. Uh, would you come with us? So I thought, well, okay, sure. So I went with them and we came to a, a peninsula in the Ganges, just a little outcropping of rock and dirt in the Ganges. And there was a guy sitting there just wearing a white dhoti. It was just like a sheet wrapped around his waist. He didn't even have a fire, no belongings. He was just sitting there. And they said, this is our guru. And then they left. So I was alone with this guy. And he motioned to me to sit down. He was what's called a Moni Baba. He didn't talk. So he said, he motioned to me to sit down. Then he waved his hand like this. And he precipitated a bowl of steamed spinach with butter on it and a toasted chapati, and he handed it to me. Now, it's not only miraculous that he could precipitate this without a fire, without a, there was no place to store food or anything, but that he knew what I was craving, you know. And so I ate this, and then I fell asleep. And when I woke up, the sun was going down, and I thought, for sure, this is my guru. And I, I waited for teachings, and I said, well, are you going to teach me something? You know, I'd, I'd like to know how to do this precipitation thing. That would be very cool. But he didn't talk. So I finally, it was, it was getting dark. I had to find a place to stay. So I said, namaste, and I left. And I met a number of beings in India that could do miraculous things. But, uh, you know, I spent time with Neem Karoli Baba, who was Ram Dass's guru. And the funny thing is, um, he hardly talked to me, you know. Uh, I sat there for months, and one day he said, who are you? And I thought, what kind of a guru are you? I've been sitting in front of you for a month, and you just now recognize me? But what he meant was who are you? Like, who are you really? You know, and um, then at some point he, 
I, 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 right after he said, who are you? I thought, you know, I was sitting there, I was sitting in the back of the room and I thought, I've been sitting here all this time and he doesn't know who I am. At that point, a banana dropped out of the air and landed in my lap. So that's like saying, yeah, I do know you're there and there's a lot more going on here than you realized, you know? So um, at any point, at some point I felt, well, this, he's a very cool guy, but he's not teaching me anything. So one day I saw he was all alone and I went up to him and I said, uh, he normally had some Indian guys sort of as guards standing near him. And I saw that they were off drinking tea somewhere. So I quickly ran up to him and I said, okay, who's my guru? And he started shaking his fist at me saying, Jesus Christ. And I thought he was swearing at me. He was going, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And I went, whoa, he's swearing at me, you know? Well, he meant, no, Jesus is your guru. You know, the funny thing is, th this is my, I don't know if you can see, this is my passport picture. This is the picture of me when I was in India with Neem Karoli Baba. So Jesus was helping me all the time, but he didn't say anything. And you look at a group of those people that were with Neem Karoli Baba and Ramdas, they all have this Christ-like energy coming through them. And I realized Jesus was really behind that whole movement. I mean, not only Jesus, but Jesus was awakening people to their own Christ nature at that time. And a lot of us got sent to be together in the, in the Himalayas there and uh, with Ramdas and these other people. And what, you know, Neem Karoli Baba is really saying was, look within, find the Christ within yourself. You are a Christ, which is what Sean is saying all the time. We are Christ, but we're in these spacesuits and all of our spacesuits are a little bit different, you know, different shapes and colors and stuff. But um, so anyway, when I came back from India, I was, I felt like I didn't really want to be on the earth anymore because I had experienced there were higher planes of being. So it, it, through, through many you know, years of meditation, I had experienced there were higher worlds. And I came back and I was staying with Jai Uttal in Berkeley. I was living on his living room floor and I had real long hair and I was wearing my white pajamas and all that I'm from India. And I had a mala around my neck and I'd, use, I'd chant mantras and stuff like that. But when I, I saw the materialism in Berkeley, that people were just trying to get, you know, better job, make more money, become famous, that didn't appeal to me. And uh, although that's, you know, what my mother raised me to do, you know, go to the right college and get the right job, marry the right woman, get the right house and have the right kids and all that sort of stuff. I didn't see those people being happy. And so, you know, at least in India, I had discovered that there were these higher worlds and you could find happiness inside, but I had no idea where to go or what to do. And I, I had lived with the, another yogi in the Himalayas for a while who was getting ready to leave his body. So these yogis can do that at will. When they feel they have fulfilled their mission, they can just leave their body and go on to a higher plane. Um, here in the new age movement they would some people would call that ascension um although the real ascension is what the tibetans call jalu which is the attainment of the rainbow body where they can actually dissolve the physical body too and uh, i have met someone who's was there when his teacher in china attained the rainbow body, he saw seven flashes of different colored light and all that was left on the ground was some hair and fingernails, you know, sort of like Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, you know, now you see him, now you don't, you know. But, um, so anyway, I was living in, in Berkeley and uh, one morning this, while I was meditating, a ball of light appeared in the room and I heard a voice that said, go to Muir Woods. 
And uh, it was pouring rain. I didn't really feel like that, but I said, well, okay. And this was about eight o'clock in the 7.30, eight o'clock in the morning. So, uh, you know, it's not very often a ball of light speaks to you. So I thought I'd better do that. So I drove to Muir Woods and I parked in the parking. It was probably then around nine. And I was the only car in the parking lot. And I um, walked through the woods and I found a hollow tree, a redwood tree that had been uh, burned by fire and it was hollowed out inside. So I wanted to get out of the rain. I got inside the trunk of the tree. And um, so it was very nice because I was protected from the rain. And I sat there and I did Vipassana meditation. Uh, this is something I'd like to share with you. It's just, you observe the in-breath and the out-breath and it stills the mind. And when a thought comes up, you just label it thinking and you come back to the breath. So I was doing this with my eyes open. Uh, this is not a method to get high or get out of the body. It's just a method that produces mindfulness. So to be more aware of your thoughts, more aware of what's going on around you. And I was doing this meditation and I was going to ask, um, I, I wanted to leave my body the way this yogi in India was going to do because I didn't want to be here anymore. And I thought before I do this, I should really pray. Um, I, I'd never had a prayer answered, but I thought it's still incumbent on me to pray just in case there is somebody who's listening. So I went down the list of people that I could pray to. Of course, I prayed to Jesus and Mary and Sai Baba and, you know, Krishna and Rama and Buddha. And you know, I just went down the list of everyone I could think of. And um, all of a sudden, a man materialized in front of me. And he looked, uh, he didn't look extraordinary. He didn't look like a master or anything. He was just wearing jeans and tennis shoes and wearing, just looked like a regular guy about my own age. And he said, he said, Peter, he knew my name. He said, Peter, your prayer has been answered. And he said, I am the part of the Godhead that has been sent to answer your prayer. And this was so amazing because if someone had walked up, I would have heard the twigs breaking and cracking and stuff. He didn't walk up. He just was there. One minute, nobody was there. And the next minute, there were two feet in front of me. And I looked up and here was this guy smiling. And um, he said, you can leave your body if you want. But before you do, I would like to show you something. I will help you leave your body. And he touched me in the center of my forehead. And the next thing I know, I'm standing outside my physical body. In another body, it looked just like this body. But I look back, and there was the physical body still sitting in the tree meditating. And he put his arm around me and took me up above the earth. So this was the guy that had forced me to come to earth in the first place, along with Jesus, you know, and now he's taking me back up off the earth. And we went to this realm where beings existed as balls of light. Um, and they emanated these beautiful rainbow colors. And that's what is called the I am presence, or in India, they would call it the Atman. That's your eternal God's self. And, you know, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And he said, know you not that you are gods. Now, when Jesus said that, he was quoting Psalms. Psalms were poems written by either probably Solomon or David. But he quoted that. He said, isn't it written, know you not that you are gods? You know, and that's a part that a lot of church stuff leaves out, you know. But 
here I was having the experience. I saw these balls of light and they were like in meditation. They were, their attention was focused inward. And he there was just the feeling of incredible bliss there. And I said, this is it. Thank you for bringing me here. Uh, I'd like to stay. And um, so I was anticipating that I was liberated and I could stay there. And then I heard this crying coming from someplace and it got louder and louder. It was very disturbing. And uh, it was beyond crying, it was really wailing and begging for help. And I looked around to see where this was coming from. And I saw beneath my feet, this blue ball, it was the earth. And he said, that is the wailing of humanity. And he said, we masters hear that all the time. And if we could cry, we would. That that is the suffering of humanity. And there was no doubt in my mind that I wanted to go back. I, I could not bear to hear that. So I said, I want to I'll, I want to go back and help. And he smiled. He said, you made the right choice. And the next thing I knew, I was back in my body inside the tree in Muir Woods. And this young man was standing next to me. And of course, by now, I realized this was not some ordinary guy that just happened to walk by. And um, he said, well, first thing he said was, I want you to go to Mount Shasta. And the first person that you meet there will tell you what to do next. And he said, now I will show you who I really am. And right in front of me, he took a few steps back and he changed into this being wearing a white robe. And I recognized him from my stay at the Theosophical Society in India that and his pictures in the front of Unveiled Mysteries, uh, I recognized him as the Master Saint Germain. Now, he's not a saint in the Catholic Church. That's just the name that he's used. In, in French history, there are three or four beings with the name Saint Germain, and that's a whole other story who he is, but I recognized him. And then he completely disappeared. And I felt like I'd been hit by lightning. I was so energized. So I got in my car, there was still nobody else in the parking lot. It was still raining and I, I got in my car to drive to Mount Shasta. And um, when I got to Mount Shasta, I ate at the breakfast place there. And uh, it was, uh, Mount Shasta in those days was a logging town and there were signs up on the, on the doors of businesses, no long hairs allowed, hippies keep out. And I sure looked like a hippie because I had long hair and you know sandals and I was wearing beads and things like that. So um, when I walked in, it was like a scene from that movie, Easy Rider. You could have heard a pin drop, people stopped and they couldn't believe I was gonna go in there. But I did, the waitress, as soon as the waitress served me, I, um, the people went back to eating. And then this young guy came up to me and he said, you're supposed to see this lady by the name of Pearl. And I said, well, I don't know who she is, but I was told to do whatever the first person told me to do. And you're the first person. So he said, you can use the phone. He owned the local health food store. I went over there. He let me use his phone. And this sweet lady said, oh, yes, please come up. So I went up right away to see her. It was walking distance from downtown. And this lady who looked like Yoda, like, like somebody's grandmother, opened the door and she said, oh, I come in, dear, I've been expecting you. And I said, I said, how could you be expecting me? We've never met before. And she said, oh, but the Master Saint Germain came this morning and told me he was sending someone to see, to see me. And so I sat down and she said, uh, tell me what brought you here. And I said, well, this guy appeared in front of me in Muir Woods. And uh, the picture of St. Germain was on the wall. And I said, that was him. And uh, so then 
she said, he's helping you, he's talking to you. And I said, I don't hear anything. Would you channel a message to me? And she said, I don't channel, that would weaken you. He's talking to your higher self. And when the, your higher self will remember this, and when the time comes for you to act, you will know spontaneously what to do. And you will perceive that as intuition. But that is how the masters work with people. They were working with you when you're asleep. They're working with you all the time. And uh, it's just we don't always hear them, you know, but they're there. And we have to sort of go on our intuition. That's kind of how I got this job today, giving a homily. I wasn't too excited about, about doing this. And uh, Annika and Ursula and a few other people were saying, oh, please, it would be nice. And, and, um, and uh, I know Annika prays very close to Mother Mary. And I said, well, I'll think about it, you know. And then one morning in meditation, I felt Mary. And I said, well, this is new. I don't usually think of Mary. And, uh, but she was saying, you know, I want you to do this homily. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a whirl, you know. So here I am. So thank you, Annika, and thank you, Mary. <laughs> I have a picture of her right over here. So this is a new experience for me, learning to work more with Mary. So I did have an experience with her a long time ago in a church in Patterson, New Jersey, where um, there was this Madonna from Italy that on occasion would shed real tears, even though the statue was made of wood. And uh, Someone said, hey, let's go see this statue. So we went. It was a huge cathedral. There were hundreds of people there. And uh, the statue of Mary was on a wooden pallet with two poles to be carried around the church. And the priest said, I need someone to carry Mary, help carry Mary around the church. I want you. And he pointed to me. I was way back in the middle of the church. You know, and I look like a beatnik, you know, and I said, you must mean this person, not me. And he said, no, you. So I went up and I said, Father, I'm not a Catholic. And he said, I know that. But he said, I want you. And the other three guys were all members of the church. They were wearing black suits, you know. And when I, I bent over to pick up the statue, the eyes were human eyes. The whole statue was wood, but there was a woman, woman's eyes looking at me. And I went, whoa, you know? And then when I picked the, picked the pole up to put on my shoulder, I felt a woman's hand on my other shoulder. And I looked to see, I thought someone from the church had come up and was touching me, but I heard her voice say, do not be afraid. Um, I will protect you on your next trip to India. I was concerned about going back to India. And she said, don't worry, I will protect you. I will be with you. And that was that. But I, I haven't really experienced her again until just recently, just, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was asked to do this homily. So I hope that I've um, pleased her. <laughs> and... Um, Oh, so I was going to get, I'm going to finish up to this thing with Pearl. Um, she said, I said, well, what do you do? And she said, I work with the I am. And she said, the same as Jesus did. All these phrases that Jesus said, I am the living light. I am the son of God. That those are, are clues to us that we can say the same thing. It's not saying I claim to be the living Christ, but I am a Christ, like, like we are all priests, you know? So she said, would you like to meditate? And I said, sure. I was going to sit on the floor and get in lotus position and shut my eyes the way I did in India. She said, you don't need to close your eyes to meditate. Um, you can just turn your attention inward and feel the love in your heart. 
And some people are more visual. You can see a sun there and say, I am the son of God. That's like S-U-N. And when I did that, I said, I am the living light. I saw light in the room. And I went, oh, that's the light I always heard about. People say, have you seen the light? I never knew what they were talking about. I thought it was a metaphor. But I said, I am the living light. And there it was in the room. It was like someone turned a light switch. And she said, whatever you say after I am is what you're creating. So always when you say I am, make sure it's something positive. And that was sort of the beginning of about a five year apprenticeship with this lady Pearl. And her teacher had been Godfrey Ray King who started the St. Germain Foundation. And um, so I began to experiment with that and then I saw that I could create with the I am affirmations. But after a while, I discovered all the stuff I created wasn't so good. You know, if I say I like I want a Ferrari and I get a Ferrari, then I have everybody's going to want to touch it and I have to worry about someone stealing it and so on. So then how do I get rid of the Ferrari and so on? And so I started to see it was better to pray first, thy will, not my will be done. So I am only creating what God wants me to create. And uh, at some point down the road, Lawrence is going to give a homily on how to do selfless action, how to create without ego. And I think that's what we're all still working on is how to be selfless beings. And I think we find that that's where the real joy is, is in giving to others. So I want to thank you. This has been a, a blessing for me to be able to share with you. And I hope I've been able to be of some service and to you. And, um, you know, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, um, to see if I can answer them. Is can you talk to us a little about your practice of meditation and the role of meditation? And I want to frame that a little bit. In the sports world, it's often said, you know, when sportsmen are lucky, well, the more I practice, the luckier I get, right? And it seems to me, <laughs> and it seems to me when, I, when I hear you and read you, you know, the more I meditate, the more synchronous mystical experiences just seem to happen, right? So the, there seems to be a foundation in your work in, in meditation. Talk about how you practice it and, and what you think it means in the experiences and journey you've taken. Sure. I would say I've tried all kinds of complicated meditations and as I go along, they become simpler and simpler. Um, the basic meditation that has given me the most benefit is this Vipassana meditation that um, you can even do with your eyes open, but looking down slightly. Um, I used to do it sitting on the floor on a cushion, but you can certainly do it sitting in a chair. Uh, those of us who have gotten a little bit older find maybe sitting in a chair a little more comfortable, but the spine should be straight. And um, the hands can be like the Buddha pose or just on your knees. And then something that helps is to put the tip of the tongue against the roof of the mouth that sort of closes a bioelectric circuit. And actually I was thinking, I don't remember the person's name who had the cornea transplant when he was saying for a day, and by the way, I'm glad that that went well, and um, that having to lie on his back and look at a spot on the ceiling for a day that must have been awful, except I, I wished I could have suggested before you had that experience, this type of Vipassana meditation, because you pick out a spot, like generally on the floor, it could be on the wall or it could be on the ceiling. But the way the practice is done is when you're sitting and you, you just let your eyes focus where it's natural and the head should be 
straight on the shoulders and the chin tucked slightly. And um, you, if you feel, as you do the practice, if you feel tired, you, you raise your gaze outward a little bit. Or if your mind is too agitated, you can bring your gaze in a little bit closer. But generally, just where your eyes come to rest on the floor. And then you just feel the rise and fall of your chest, the in-breath and the out-breath. And you don't try to breathe faster or slower. The breath will adjust itself. And after a while, well, you'll, you'll start, thoughts will come up. Like first thought is, this is ridiculous. Why am I doing this, you know? Um, then you put a label, you just label that thought, thinking, that was just the thought. Or, you know, my knee hurts. Well, okay, that's a sensation. You can label it sensation or you can label it thinking. And this will go on, but gradually, you keep coming back to the in-breath and the out-breath. And after a while, the thoughts will be less frequent. And there is actually a gap between the thoughts. And in that gap, there is a sense of peace and stillness. And actually, that is where you contact the universal mind, or you that is where you are receptive to guidance. It's very hard to get guidance when the mind is chattering. Like my mother said to do this, my uncle said to do that, my best friend says do this, I read that the right thing is that, and these all these thoughts are whirling around about what to do. But if you can label those thoughts, just thinking or thought, and come back to the breath, gradually you discipline your mind, and there is a silence. Now, the mind has been is sort of analogous to a little puppy that you get. And the first time you take the puppy for a walk on a leash, it's pulling every which way. And it's trying to lead you where it wants to go. And you know the next day, you pull the leash in a little bit. And then the puppy gets used to that. Every day you take the puppy for a walk, you pull it in a little bit more. And after a month or two, the puppy is walking by your ankle and is perfectly happy. And it, it realizes it's doing what it wants to do, which is to go for a walk with you. So the mind is like that. It goes this way, that way, so on. And you just gently pull it in and say, that's a thought, that's okay, but let's come back to the breath, you know? then after a while, you rest in that space between the thoughts for a longer time, and you enter the world of no self, like no, no ego, actually. And there's the second part of this meditation is the self-inquiry, which is actually what the Vipassana means. The first part is just stilling the mind. The second part is you can say, who is actually observing my mind? Like, when you label something thought, there was a part of the mind that was having a thought. There's another part observing that you're having a thought. And there's a part that's disciplining it. And then there is this no thought. But where is all this taking place? This is all taking place on sort of a computer screen in your mind you can close down that screen and there's another screen, a bigger screen, a vaster consciousness. And so through practicing this self-inquiry, which the basic question is the question that Neem Karoli Baba asked me, who are you? And I find it works better instead of saying, who are you? Where you, you wanna come up with like, I'm Peter or I'm the CEO of this company or you know, I'm doing a Zoom meeting or, you know, I ask more like, what am I? Or what is observing this? And it takes you into a vast expanded consciousness. 
And in that consciousness, you become aware of things that you didn't know. You come up with answers and um, don't necessarily expect to hear a voice. That's not part of the meditation, but it aligns you more with your higher self, which is not bound by ego. It's not bound by this body. It's that eternal consciousness that goes on from life to life. And um, that is the basic uh, meditation that I would practice. There are also others that go along with that. Like you can come out of that. And when you're still in that stillness, you can simply say, I am and meditate on that. But the I that I am is not the ego little self. It's the expanded, what I would call the God self or your eternal self. And in that you can create, like I am going forth today in perfect happiness, bringing about the divine plan. I am blessing everyone I contact today. So, so it goes from meditation actually into creation. So that's again where we actually become the God beings that we are. It's not just realizing God, but it's actually creating, you know, with the God consciousness. And I think this is a little difference between what I call the Buddha consciousness and the Christ consciousness. I mean, if Buddha and Christ were in the same room, they would feel like brothers, you know, and they'd both be very loving, enlightened beings. But whenever you see a statue of Buddha, the eyes are closed. He's sitting down, looking inward. So to me, that represents the divine mind aspect, the inner knowing. When you see a statue of Jesus, he's always standing, and maybe he has his hand up blessing, or he He's making an offering, or he's pointing to his heart, or he's blessing. His eyes are open. So to me, that's the Buddha consciousness in action, that the Christ consciousness is aware of the Buddha self, but in relationship with others, the aspect of compassion and giving. In fact, uh, on my way to India, I stopped at Mount Athos in Greece, which is a sacred mountain where there are a lot of monasteries and I met some of the monks in town at a restaurant and these beings seemed to me to be the epitome of enlightenment. They were just absolutely radiant loving beings and when they were finished dinner I went up to them and I said um, excuse me but I'm, I'm on my way to India to seek enlightenment but you guys look enlightened and could you tell me what your practice is? What is your spiritual practice? They said, we only have one prayer that we do all the time. And we say, may the, well, there was a, there was a statue there with actually Jesus showing the sacred heart, you know, opening his chest. And they say, our prayer is may the heart of Christ be everywhere known. So that's like, yes, the heart of Christ is in me, but it's also in you. It's in everybody, even the people that hurt us, that we have to hold that image. And that has stayed with me to this day as an incredible practice, even if we don't meditate formally, to try to keep that in mind. That was a wonderful description of meditation. Thank you. Really, really wonderful. Very close to a lot of things that I experienced. So, um... So I was wondering if you um, are part of or head of, I don't know much about you, I'm sorry, part of or head of a spiritual community um, where you live. No, I, I, I'm not a joiner, you know, except I, I started this church, which is mostly online called Church of the Seven Rays. And I initially started that as a publishing company for my books. Um, but gradually it's expanded out uh, to become more of an online thing where I do some Zoom sessions and these are posted on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, but I don't, most of my meetings are on, on Zoom. Good morning. Thank you for your talk this morning, Peter. 
I'd well, like to you. know more about Ananda Maimi, Ananda Maima, and your yeah. experiences with her. Have you had? Ex are you a fan of hers? Or? I know a little bit about her, and it's all sounding joyful. Joyful. Well, uh, okay, I'll, I'll tell you as briefly as I can. Um, I heard it. she was uh, a, a friend of Yogananda's, and. Um, she was one of those people seemed to be God realized from childhood. And uh, I won't go into her biography, but I went to her ashram in Benares on New Year's Eve. A whole bunch of us that were with Neem Karoli Baba went there and it was a very formal ashram scene. And she actually seemed bored with the whole thing. And I, I made a prayer. Here's another prayer that was answered. I said, I wish I could meet her alone sometime out in the country away from the ashram. And about a month later, I was in Jagannath Puri. I was at a, a store buying rice and the woman in front of me turned around and it was her. And um, I bought her some candy and gave it to her. And uh, she said, thank you. And you know, we were walking along the road together and she had a couple loads of groceries. And you know, I didn't want to impinge on her privacy but, you know, and also in India, men and women don't talk to each other on the street, you know. But I thought she's got these heavy groceries. So I went up and said, may I carry your groceries? And she said, no, thank you. But then she started talking to me. And the funny thing is she supposedly had a vow, a vow of silence where she didn't talk. But uh, the funny thing is she was talking in Bengali and I was talking in English. We both understood each other perfectly. Mm -hmm. So we walked along talking and then she came to her ashram. You know, it turned out she just wanted to be a normal person and cook breakfast for her devotees. So she'd gone to the store and bought rice and vegetables and going back to cook for everybody. And the next day I was on a rickshaw coming from the Jagannath temple and she was with several of her disciples by the side of the road. She saw me before I saw her. And, you know, they have this expression in India, namaste, it means that the God in me greets the God in you. And I guess she saw the God in me because when I saw her, she was bowing like that. And this energy hit my heart that almost knocked me out of the rickshaw. And I, I knew she had seen God, you know, in me. And I went back to the place where I was staying and for the next three days, I just, we had a flat roof up there on the Bay of Bengal. I sat there for three days meditating. I said, I want to see in myself what she saw in me. And uh, that was one of the greatest boosts on my, on my path of awakening. And that is something we can all do when you see somebody, try to see the God in them, you know, just like a sun there. And when I met Pearl, she could do the same thing, but she taught me consciously how to do that. You can say, I am, you know, the, the presence in God in me is blessing the God in you. And we can sit and do that with each other, just seeing God in each other. That's in the whole other meditation that I do with people. It's the open-eyed meditation. I, I, they used to call it the looking meditation. I call it the pearl meditation. But that's briefly what the gift she gave to me. And I recently had some contact. She's now out of the body, but she and Mother Mary. In fact, there's a whole, you hear about the Great White Brotherhood, which is a term I don't use anymore for obvious reasons, but there is a whole sisterhood of light that is vast of enlightened women who embody these divine qualities. They're all working to nurture humanity. So I've been praying to know more about them. Maybe I could maybe someday write a book on them. So anyway. I, um, I really have uh, enjoyed your talk and find it fascinating. Um, but I got to tell you, the heretic part of me is coming out. And so I've got to, uh, I want to run a few things behind uh, by you. Sure. Um, I've, uh, over the years, I've uh, gone to or experienced uh, several hundred uh, lectures from spiritual people and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and 
uh, the one thing that really stood out in my mind is this one particular one where the, the fellow said, he said, look, he said, I, I spent eight years traveling around the world, sitting at the feet of all these masters. And he said, there's several things that I concluded after that. He said, one was nobody, but nobody really knows what's going on. And the second thing he said is, if you're going to get anywhere, you got to do it yourself. And he wasn't eliminating wisdom that you could pick up here and there and so forth, but you really got to do it yourself. And the other thing I want to say is that um, the, these various spiritual masters, they, they don't, they all seem to have their, no matter how enlightened they are, they all seem to have their little idiosyncrasies and they all have different uh, views on what their path should be. Uh, a good example is, is Jesus and Buddha. Uh, they both have, they have very different ideas on how to get from here to there. And um, Buddha emphasizes so much on non-attachment and doesn't talk much about God, at least in the, in the mm -hmm. teachings there, He's, it's not mentioned. So there's, uh, there's all these uh, <laughs> idiosyncrasies and I'm really wondering Who's going to really deliver the goods, <laughs> you know? Okay. Well, you've asked a number of questions here that could easily be uh, another hour talk, but uh, let me start with the main one. Um, your path starts at your own feet, you know? So uh, for me to say, go to India and see this guy, that's not necessarily the right thing for you to do. Um, I have walked different paths and seen the value in each one, but um, I, what I find is you, if you pray, wherever it is, praise to whatever you want to call the source or Jesus or whoever it is, I want teachings, I want a lesson, I want to grow spiritually you will get some kind of guidance, you know. Now, you know, see, I had an experience shoveling manure where I experienced enlightenment. That didn't make me permanently enlightened, but was an experience of it. And I can't tell someone else, go out and shovel manure, and you're going to have the same experience. They'd be very upset with me if they didn't have some kind of experience, you know, but that's why I don't promise that. Um, but I, I do find if you do some practice, like for a year or something, and you don't see any fruit, try something else. I've had people come to me and say, I've been doing this Tibetan Buddhist practice. I've got all these initiations and empowerments and everything, and nothing has happened. I don't feel any close to Buddhahood. And I said, well, would you be willing to try something else? And they say, sure. Okay, here's a mantra. Why don't you try this, you know? at least worth to try something else, you know. Um, and I would say, don't, don't judge the path by the teacher either. You know, there are many great teachers and they, like you say, they have their own idiosyncrasies. They have their human side and um, try to see the goodness that they are offering and um, just don't worship them as, you know, that's that's the danger, not only for you, but for them. You know, these people worshiping the guru. Um, the guru is everywhere at every moment. There's something the Tibetan Buddhists call the Vajra Guru. That's the indestructible guru. In a sense, it's your higher self, but it's everywhere. So I, I've seen people come to Mount Shasta, and they're told that people have been that rock is the door into the mountain. You're going to experience the Lemurian Brotherhood. And, you know, it was just a rock this person chose because they make their living as a tour guide on the mountain. And it's convenient to take people there. There's a parking lot and everything right nearby. So people sit there and they have some amazing experience. Well, that's the Vajra Guru. It's coming through that location because they need they need that to have that experience at that time. Um, so 
you know, if you pray to the Vajra Guru, the indestructible Guru that is everywhere at all times, you, I mean, sometimes I like, could even be walking down the sidewalk and ask for a teaching and something may come up. Like sometimes I'll, I say, I want confirmation that this is right. And it'll say, look at the clock. And it says 1133, which to me is a special number. But you may have some other number you know, the number five or whatever. And that's, oh, that's the confirmation. But, you know, I can guarantee you that if you ask inwardly with great sincerity for spiritual teaching, that something will open up for you, you know. And, you know, don't, don't disregard it because the teacher is kind of weird or has human eccentricities or something like that, you know. And, you know, my experience is there are some beings that truly know what's going on. Now, you know, Krish I spent some time at Krishnamurti's house, not when he was there. I was allowed to stay there, however. And his whole thing was don't listen to any guru. Of course, he became a guru himself, you know, but, you know, they're trying to decide even if it's okay to meditate at all because gurus teach it. And we're told Krishnamurti says, don't do what gurus tell you to do. But... You know, you are not alone, the source, you are an emanation of the source, and that source has a plan for you, and you can ask to know more about that, what that is, and, you know, as far as the future of the world, there is, um, where your attention is, there you are, so if your attention is on doom and gloom, you will enter that world, if your attention is on the higher world, you will go into that world. You know, it says in the Bible, there will be the old heaven and the old earth will pass away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And, you know, sometimes I feel torn between them because you look at the news and you identify with the old heaven and earth. And I, in meditation, I try to go into the new one, you know. And I'll just as a, an aside, there's a dirt road out here and on the way to Wairika. And I drove down that road one day and there was a town there I'd never seen before. And later I went back and that town was not there. Now I'm not doing drugs. I'm not taking alcohol. It was like a solid town, you know? And I, my teacher Pearl and her husband Jerry had similar experiences. And that I've seen in dream state anyway, that there's a whole other civilization out here in this valley. And I think that's the new heaven and the new earth. And that those, if we can raise our frequency, our vibratory rate, raise our consciousness, we will move into that world and that into that new heaven and new earth, you know, so. Yeah, that's really interesting, except I'm just wondering, um, the reality seems to be at this point in time that human beings are destroying the planet with poisoning it and cutting down the rainforests and on and on and on global warming. Um, that seems to be a universal reality. And I'm wondering what your experience is with some of these uh, enlightened beings, what they have to say about that. How do we turn that around? How that can be corrected. You know, if you've seen the movie, Oh God, with John Denver and George Burns, uh, you know, God, played by George Burns, says, look, I gave you a perfect earth and you guys screwed it up. Don't ask me to fix it for you. You've got to fix it yourself. Um, but I think it's important not to get depressed by the, you know, what's happening on the earth to focus on on the new heaven and the new earth, which you're only going to enter through your attention. You know, what your attention is on, you become. And none of these beings that I know have really talked about the future so much, except, well, Sai Baba said, if you, he said, it, it, if you want to enter the, the new earth, you want the new earth to come about, get busy, <laughs> you know. But it's, again, a question of, um, 
what you put your attention on, I've experienced there is another, you know, there are many dimensions inter, or I'd say frequencies interpenetrating the physical. You know, there's stories that Mars and Venus were inhabited at one time. And there's some people who say they have contact with beings still living there, but they're, they're in a higher frequency. That, that's a, a, higher, a higher dimensional Venus. I've had experience of beings in the sun. Now, I'm not under the illusion that they're living in the physical sun, but the sun is a focal point. In fact, in the Vedas, they talk about a whole dynasty that came to Earth from the sun. There is a civilization that lives behind the sun or in a higher octave, I'd say a higher octave of the sun. So there's a higher octave Earth that's already here. The, the, the new world is already here. And at some point, we will move into that. I know that to be a fact. We will move into the new earth and the new heaven. And that's why it's so important not to get angry at people for you know, what they're doing. Anyway, I hope, hope that's yeah. helpful.